Hey, welcome to the moral news for the seven days ending on April 21, 2023. Well, it's finally happened. I've known it was coming for years, but historic item this week, GAFCON, the Global Anglican Fellowship, uh, has basically fired the Archbishop of Canterbury and they've cut the rope. So those of you that are unfamiliar, the Anglican Fellowship is around 80 to 90 million possibly even more uh, Christians around the world. That's a pretty significant fellowship. I think the largest Protestant denomination in the United States is the Southern Baptist Convention. What is it, 18 million uh, here in America? So when you're looking at 90 million folks, that's that's a big deal. Uh, 70 to 75 million of those are in the global south, and a small number are in the Church of England. So four or five hundred years ago, the basically the, the Church of England fired the Pope and said that they would have their own archbishop. And that's the way it's been for, like I say, centuries. But uh, in the last period of years, uh, we come to a different deal. And so basically to the, what happened in the statement released today, the, the Global Anglican Fellowship has basically fired the Archbishop of Canberra. He's no longer the foremost among equals as he was and let's listen in to several bits here uh, where they describe what's going on. The current divisions in the Anglican Communion have been caused by radical departures from some within the Communion have been taken captive by hollow and deceptive philosophies of this world as we see in Colossians 2, verse 8. To hear and heed God's word undermines the mission of the church as a whole. The Bible is God's word written. Faithful messengers, as we see in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, it carries God's own authority is its own interpreter and it does not need to be supplemented nor can it be overturned by human wisdom. The current crisis in the Anglican Communion Despite 25 years of by most Anglican primates, repeated departures from the authority of God's word have torn the fabric of the communion. These ones were black repentance, this tear cannot be mended. The latest of these departures is the majority vote by the General Synod of the Church of England by the bishops to enable same-sex couples to receive God's blessing. It grieves the Holy Spirit and us that the leadership of the Church of England is determined by same-sex unions. It is pastorally deceptive and blasphemous to craft prayers that invoke blessing in the name of the and the Holy Spirit. Any refusal to follow the biblical teaching that the only appropriate context of sexual activity is the exclusive woman in marriage violates the created order. As we see in Genesis chapter 2 verse 24 and Matthew chapter 19 verses 4 through 6 and verse 9 
public statements by the Archbishop of Canterbury and other leaders of the Church of England in support are a betrayal of their ordination and consecration vows to banish error and to uphold and defend the truth taught in scripture. They're pointing to specific issues, specifically the issue of same-sex blessings, which basically they say that, yeah, the Church of England kind of did it to themselves. They shot themselves in the foot here because they knew the World Church wouldn't accept this. We have no confidence that the Archbishop of nor the other instruments of communion led by him, we cannot work together. We consider that those who refuse to repent have abdicated their right to leadership within the Anglican communion. And we commit ourselves to working with Orthodox primates and other leaders to reset the communion on its biblical foundation. It is not appropriate pastoral care to mislead people by pretending that God blesses sexually active relationships with the same sex. This is unloving. As Anglican identity is defined by this and not by recognition from the sea of Canterbury. Both GSFA that due to the departures from orthodoxy articulated above, they can no longer recognize the Archbishop of Canterbury as an instrument of communion. The Church of England has chosen to impair her relationship with the Orthodox provinces in the communion. We welcome the GSF 2023, calling for a resetting and reordering of the... Now, at the end of this, they observed a moment of silence. And, uh, and after that moment of silence, they had a little prayer, and then they cut loose, and we can see here some of their reaction. I think this is pretty pent up. This is, this is like a lifetime event. Uh, this was... This is a, a total repudiation of the same-sex nonsense and LGBTQ business going on in the Church of England. Here it is. It's right here. You can see it. Uh, these folks are not having any more of it. So this was the end. Today's the end. Now they say, yes, we want the, the Archbishop to repent and the Church of England to repent. And I don't, but I join them I, I, in terms of I don't expect that to happen. So anyway, Strong business here today. The Archbishop of Canterbury, Justin Welby, fired. The Archbishop position of being the most, uh, the, the, the foundation of the Church of England, uh, that is gone now. And now it's going to be on the basis of a statement of beliefs and adherence to those beliefs. So this is a giant shift and uh, worth, worth knowing about. It's something very historic that's happened uh, today, today on planet Earth. All right, let's look at a couple of other items as well, just quickly. There's another item out there in America where uh, this fellow, Goff is his name, he was a post postal worker and he was bullied and forced, you know, he, he wouldn't, he's a Sunday keeping Christian and he was forced basically out of that position because uh, the postal service was determined to deliver Amazon packages in a contract they have with Amazon to deliver them on Sunday. So I actually told my postal supervisors, I feel like you're boxing me into a corner and you're asking me to choose to do what you say the postal supervisor, or to do what God says. And I said, I mean no disrespect whatsoever, but I have to choose God. My conviction is that strong. 
how so he views the, the Sunday as being the Lord's Day and not Sabbath. Of course, it's actually the seventh day from sundown Friday to sundown Saturday. That's the biblical Ten Commandments Sabbath, the Sabbath that Jesus observed. But anyway, we love and respect this, this person, this brother, for seeking to uphold his own convictions. And uh, now they're going to try to see if they can get the Supreme Court to adjust it. So this was heard on the 18th here a couple of days ago. Uh, by the United States Supreme Court. We don't know what will ultimately happen, but I'm watching it and I'm highlighting it here because I, I personally am a Sabbath keeper. I observe the seventh day Sabbath, and I've been so blessed in my Christian experience by some of those pieces. Uh, so we'll see what happens. And I like what his lawyer says right here. Well, I mean, the good news is that we have the actual language of the statute on our side. So yeah, the law as it was written uh, seems to support his uh, his conscientious conviction and again, we will see what happens. Um, I want to go to one other item, but first I want to read you uh, just these quick two paragraphs. There's a fellow years ago, about 100 years ago, named A.T. Jones, Alonzo Jones, and he was big on religious liberty. And I just want to share a brief quotation from him about the Sabbath, because there was an agitation in the 1890s for a national Sunday law in the United States. And so you might be interested in, he, he fought against that. Uh, but let's see what, what he says here. So you see, when God set up the Sabbath, he had set creation all before man to start with, and man could see God in creation. But the Lord wanted to get nearer to man than that. Man could study creation and find a knowledge about God, but God wanted him to have the knowledge of God. In creation, he could know about him. In the Sabbath, he would know him, because the Sabbath brings the living presence, the sanctifying presence, the hallowing presence of Jesus Christ to the man who observes it, Indeed. He's talking to the congregation. So then the original purpose of God in creation and the Sabbath as the sign of it was that man might know God as he is and what he is to the world in and through Jesus Christ. Is not that so? The congregation responds, yes. Do you see that? Congregation responds, yes. What is it for now then? Congregation says, the same. So that's Sermon 20, 1893 Sermons, uh, Alonzo T. Jones, uh, the Sabbath, a great Christian blessing. But And uh, we have one more item here from Canada. This is a law they're trying to bring in in Canada. And uh, you might say, well, uh, it's the moral news, but you only deal with Christians. Well, there's a fellow here named Sadat. You might want to hear from Sadat. He is a Muslim, and he's concerned about the same-sex inroads and so on going on in the law in Canada. It was passed in the House of Commons with conservative blessings, mind you. So don't blame this simply on the Liberal Party. And it's passed two readings in the Senate. So this bill, which is called C6, is, as I said, well on its way to becoming law here in Canada. Conversion therapy as defined in this bill is not just what you think of, i.e. A, a man being tortured in order to make him revert back to heterosexuality. Rather, conversion therapy means a practice, treatment or service designed to change a person's sexual orientation to heterosexual, to change a person's gender identity or gender expression to cisgender, or to repress or reduce non-heterosexual attraction or sexual behavior or non-cisgender gender expression. I'm grateful to my friend, Pastor Greg Armstrong, who first brought this issue to my attention, who cared enough about it. His concern for all Canadian children made him sit down with me, discuss this issue with me, and really bring its importance to my attention. As Greg said to me, he said, Sadat, that's what they want you to think when they hear conversion therapy. They want you to have that image of a man being electrocuted in his genitals so that people who don't dig deeper into this bill will not be bothered by it. You know, the name sounds like something that we should agree with, an anti-conversion therapy bill. But this is simply a disguise for something much, much more. The meaning of conversion therapy in this bill has been expanded so recklessly, so vastly, that even traditional Christian or Muslim spiritual counseling to a member of the same faith who is struggling with same-sex attraction could fall within the confines, could fall within that definition of an attempt at conversion therapy and therefore could be illegal. Now remember the wording of the bill, any practice or treatment that is intended to repress or even reduce non-heterosexual attraction or behavior. So for so isn't it sad that so many Christians are losing their way? They're not following the word of God. 
And it's, it's so clear that this, this Muslim can still see the issues. Glad you just joined me for the moral news in this seven days ending April 21, 2023. See you next week.